We believe in a church. Amen. Amen. Um, it's not very easy to stand in front. And I like not having a mic which you have to hold in your hand because then you will see <laughs> all the shaking. So now that it's hands free, I hope you won't see me shake. Amen. I consider it a privilege to be able to share this evening. And I always go back and think about education and how we get into schools and the court houses of learning. And when we get into the house of God, which he calls the house of prayer, we don't spend so much time in prayer. But I'm glad that we spend some time before having this sharing. Putting our petitions before God that we may have our questions, our petitions answered by Him. So I'm grateful for that. As we are going to get into the sharing, I kind of ask that you bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father, Lord, today, we thank you so much for the privilege of prayer. We ask that as you speak to us, we may send us a word that will transform our hearts and the word may be made flesh and be manifest in our lives, not just for today, but for the rest of the week and until we cross those shores in heaven. I ask in Jesus' name. It was uh, midnight last night. I received a message which you read as follows Emergency SOS. There is an emergency and I need your help. You are being notified because you are one of my emergency contacts. My current location is in the coordinates we were given. I woke up and I was uh, alarmed because it was from my friend's phone number. So quickly I got my phone and I called and there was no answer. I called again and there was no answer. So I quickly got those coordinates, punched them into Google and it gave me a location not too, too far from where I was. So I tried to call one more time. There was no answer, so I got into the car and drove to where the location was. And as I was approaching the place, I looked around for any signs of something that had happened at that scene, but I couldn't see anything. I drove around, went to people, it was just off the road, checked the drainages, checked everything. Everything appeared normal. I left that place and drove to UTH. Have you received a patient by such and such a name? They said no. I left and went to Living One House Hospital and asked the same question and they said no. And I was stuck. I didn't know what had happened to my friend and I didn't know where to find him. So I did the only other thing I could do, which was present a case to God in prayer. So I sent a message to his number and I said, I've driven around for almost an hour. I can't seem to find you. I'm hoping this is just some mistake and you're all right. That said, God knows and he'll take care of you. At 5, 12 in the morning, I got a call from him and it sounded like he had just woken up. And I was relieved, as you know. So I asked him, are you okay? And he said, uh, yes, what's the problem? <laughs> so I said, no, if you're okay, that's good, you can go back to sleep. <laughs> he said, no, what's the problem? I don't want to talk about it later, go back to sleep. So I thank God that he answered that prayer and my friend was okay. To my request, God said yes. And many times I wonder, because it's easy to know what to do when God says yes. But what about when God says no? Not long ago, my mother came for a routine antenatal visit and while assessing how I discovered the baby was not well. And counselor, counselor told us this is the situation, this is what we think is going on. And she said, 
they know that can't be. This is my fourth pregnancy and I have prayed, I've been praying for this child from the time this child was conceived, from even before. So it can't be that things are not going. Tried to counsel her, went through all the tests and she said, no, it's not possible. So we want to go through with what you are saying. I'll come back tomorrow after having prayed with someone. And said fine. She went back home and she came back the next day. She demanded to have a cesarean section done because she knew her baby was fine despite what we had said. And so we had to proceed with what the patient's request was and we did the operation and the baby was not fine. God had said no. A few years ago I was in the emergency room at UTH and my father was not standing very far from me. Wow. I was trying to resuscitate my grandfather with some other doctors. I know he had prayed. I know I was praying even in that time. I had actually gone through a course that taught me how to resuscitate a person properly. And before that incident, I was looking forward to an opportunity to resuscitate someone because I had learned how to do it. But God said no. He still died. There's many different incidences. Even when I go into scripture, I think about the story of Paul, who had lived a very powerful life after his conversion from Saul to Paul. He lived a very, very powerful life. He wrote almost or over half of the New Testament, prayed for people, worked all sorts of miracles, but he still had that thorn in his flesh that he prayed for every now and again, three times in fact he prayed, take this away from me. I will be able to work for you better if this is taken away from me. But God didn't take it away. God said no. So it's easy to know what to do when God says yes. We ask for this and God gives it to us. We use what it is. But when God says no, it can be a little hard for us to deal with. And I would like to propose one of the things that we could do when God says no. So shall we turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 to 28. As we are turning our Bibles there, I ask that somebody else turn their Bible to Mark chapter 7 and read verse 24. So the first one will read Mark 7. Verse 24. Mark 7, 24. The Bible says, From there they arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And they entered a house and wanted to know one from God, but he could not reveal it. Okay, so Jesus enters this city and he's trying not to be seen. Somebody please read from, uh, from the other text, from Matthew, chapter 15, verse 21 to 28. We'll go verse by verse. Matthew 15, verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Next verse. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Okay, we'll pause just there for a little bit. Jesus is not, he did not want to be seen from the text that I read from Mark. But somehow, this woman breaches his privacy. She arrests his attention even as he is moving through the city. And we continue in verse 23. Verse 23. Jesus did not answer a word. Pause. How many of us have had such an experience even in our prayers? We are crying out to God and he answers not a word. 
It's easy to turn back after such a thing happens. You see, he does not respond by even turning to look at her. He does not respond by a word of mouth. He does not respond by actions. He simply does not respond at all. But she does something very interesting. Well, interesting things happen afterwards. Please continue on. Verse 23, I'll continue. It says, So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Send her away. You can see this woman is troubling them. She keeps insisting her case towards Jesus, such that the disciples want to intervene and say, No, send her away, because she is troubling us. And then Jesus responds, and his response is very <laughs> interesting. Please, Lord. Verse 24 He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. It's a tough thing to hear when you are not included in the bracket of which Christ is saying is his mission. He excludes her and says, listen, I was not sent for you. Stay away. If I'm going to be an obedient Christian, what I will do then is simply say sorry. And I will step aside. I will go back and I will cease to plead my case. But this woman does something that for me is heroic. Please continue to read for us. Verse 25. The woman came and knelt before her. Lord help me, she said. Verse 26. Please go on. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Does this sound like Jesus? Some people would say, God, and I'm quoting, some people would say, God is behaving ungodly. It doesn't sound like Jesus. It doesn't sound like the one who cares so much for us. How can he make such a comparison? How can he sideline her? First ignore her, then give that initial statement and push her away once again. If I am the one who was in that situation, that would be enough for me to stop. It is a convincing no from God and I will cease to plead my case. But that woman is not like me. Because she goes on. He's continuing to. Read. Verse 27. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He's gone. 28. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. It's, it's almost as if all of the resistance that she had been meeting in her requests, pleading, help me, help me, help me, all of the rejection that was given to her by Jesus, only fed her desire to ask him more. It only increased her intensity to beg from the master, the one whom she knew had an answer. Even though for us, for me, just one no, one episode of being slighted is enough for me to turn around and believe I must not continue to pursue this God because he does not care for me. I find this show of faith to be heroic. Nothing, nothing short of it 
I see that Jesus himself also found this to be heroic because he said, What faith is this? What great faith this woman has shown after having more or less pushed her away and she continued to fight. But this is not the only story in scripture that is there that tells us of persistence in prayer. So I quickly want us to turn to one more, which we will close with, which is in Luke 11, from verse 5 to 9. In our sharing today, our title comes from this passage, and it's because of his importunity. Luke 11, verses 5 to 9. Somebody just read through the entire text quickly and go.
There's a story of the widow as well, where the king ends up saying, she troubled me, so I will just do what she, what she wants, because she's troubling me. But we're talking about God in our case, a God who cares for us. So I'll close with a few words. The imperative necessity of importunate prayer is plainly set forth in the word of God and it needs to be stated and restated in our world today. We are apt to overlook this vital truth. The love of ease, spiritual indolence, religious slothfulness all operate against this kind of petition. Our praying, however, needs to be pressed and pursued with an energy that never tires. A persistency which will not be denied and a courage which never fails. When we go back into the Old Testament, we see that prayer ascends by fire. In the sanctuary, we see it ascends by fire. There must be a meteoric strength with desire that is going to penetrate through this space that is there between earth and heaven. Many times our faith is not strong enough to get of the goodness of the glories of God immediately. So we encounter delay, which we must persevere through, we must remain arduous, we must remain vehement, we must be persistent such that our strength, our faith, is strengthened and strengthened and strengthened such that we can be able to bring down the eternal into experience and time. That's something that I hope can be our experience in our day to day. We have needs too to give thought to that mysterious fact of prayer and the certainty that there will be delays, denials, and seeming failures in connection with its exercise. We are to prepare for these, to brook them, and to cease not in our urgent prayer. Like a brave soldier who, as the conflict grows sterner, exhibits a superior courage than the earlier stages of the battle, so does the praying Christian. When delay and denial face him, Increase his earnest asking and cease not until prayer prevails. In closing, I'll say don't underestimate the power of prayer. Don't underestimate the power of importunate prayer. Reach out and do not loosen or lessen your grip. Love or care enough for your own soul because awaiting the onset of our opportunity and insistence is the Father's heart, the Father's hand, the Father's infinite power and the Father's infinite willingness to hear and to give to His children.